for a while you couldn't make a living here. And that was after the whole incident at the White House. For yes, ten but years. You was it ten years that you were yes, something like that. basically unable to perform in this country? Yes, and make a but living. I could go elsewhere. Until all of this subsided. And we have to talk about that because many people young people will not know about that whole affair with the White House, your being invited to this luncheon, Lady Bird Johnson, fifty women as I understand it, about yes. to talk about problems facing young people. Yes. And you at one point and we were in the midst of the Vietnam War and you spoke out. Because I was asked to by her. What I, what I work with, and still my group is still in Los Angeles, Kidsville group, kids whom we try to take off the street, bring in too. I work with, and I have been all my, not only my career life, but even from the beginning of time, like with Josh White, you know, I have a few pennies, can I help you, you know, that kind of thing. And even if I don't have any money, let's talk about whatever it is that is a botheration to your conscience. And I work with inner city kids. And I had been responsible for getting a building for a group called Rebels with a Cause in Washington. And they wanted, I don't know, $250,000, let's say, to buy a building so that they could bring kids in, teach them a trade, then put them back in the community, in our society. So they knew about my work in America among the inner city kids. So that's why I was invited to this luncheon. Why is there so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America? Was the invitation on, was the writing on my invitation? And therefore, I didn't want to go because I thought of oh, politicians, you know, they, those luncheons, what are they going to mean? Blah, 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 and that's it. But the White House kept calling me and saying, yes, Mrs. Johnson definitely wants you to come. So, okay, I go. So all of the pictures that were taken that you see in the newspapers, were before the luncheon. Now when the luncheon begins, the women were looking at the dishes underneath the plates and things to see what era of the history they came from, so forth and so on, things like that. <gasps> so enthralled about the fact that they were there. And that was all very exciting. Then in walks President Johnson. He puts his elbow on the pulpit that was suddenly out there rolled into the middle of nowhere and he starts talking about blah 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 and I raised my hand to ask questions and off, obviously he was not prepared to answer any kind of questions because I wanted to ask about the social security that we were beginning to get into uh, knowledge about the fact that it won't be there and da, 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 da. and he was suddenly taken out of the room anyway after the luncheon now we're supposed to get up and take our turn to give speeches now remember, the title of the invitation was, Why is there so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America? Finally, after I heard a lot of people get up and say things like, Well, it's very nice, Mrs. Johnson, that you're planting seeds along Route 66, and if you put trees in the center of Harlem on 7th Avenue, I think that would... What was on the invitation? But all of them were catering to the fact that, what do you call that word? No, thorning up to the boss, so to speak. So when I raised my hand, she kept saying, that's all right, Eartha, you will finally get your turn. So I kept raising my hand. So finally, I raised my hand to a point where she recognized me. And I said, I think we've forgotten what the subject of this luncheon is all about. And I recited what the subject was. And I said, one of the reasons why our boys are running away from the United States because they come to me wherever I am in the world and they tell me what they feel. Our position in Vietnam, they don't like it. We've been there long enough to realize we cannot win this war. It's a silly war. It's an unwinnable war. And we don't want to go. That, that's not that we don't love America, but we don't want to be involved with that war. So I told her what the kids had told me, the boys had told me. And I said, because they, that's why they smoke pot, because they just want to go to sleep until everything is all over. Anyway, 
Whatever I said to her that day, the best report was in the Washington Post, I read later on. Suddenly the meeting was over. I understand that she started to tear up. I don't know. I was not close enough to see that. But I was, I had a car that they, the hotel at the White House had sent for me to come there. But then all of a sudden, now I don't have a car. So I'm walking around waiting for a car. And I had to hitchhike my way back to the hotel, so to speak. What was the response, by the way, to what you said? After you made your point, how did one woman who was sitting to my right, she leaned over and whispered to me. She said, thank you, Eartha, for saying what you've said. We all feel the same way, but unfortunately, 75% of the women in this room, husbands, work for President Johnson. So they couldn't say anything about what they really felt. And I find out what was actually felt when I was in a car being taken to the place where I had been responsible for these kids getting their building. And they called me to ask me that they wanted to see me so they could thank me for that. And I heard in the car that one of them had come to get me. I was heard on the radio. Eartha Kid made Brother Mrs. Johnson cry. I didn't see her cry. But he was the one, I think, that decided, because I read in the newspapers that I got, that was Seymour Hirsch or Maxwell, no, Max, no. Seymour Hirsch, Jack Anderson. Uh, Seymour Hirsch from the New York Times called me and said that they would like to print what they had found. Wait, what's that? The gods have been very good to me. And the people, my fans, have been absolutely wonderful to me. And they are the ones who adopted me. They are the ones who made me feel worthwhile. But no one person ever did that. And I'm not talking about my daughter, Kit, that's an adagio on itself. But no one person has ever come into my life and made me feel so great as the audience has. That's why I say every time I'm on that stage, I'm always afraid I'm going to be given away. So I'm constantly with my soul actually begging to be wanted and needed. And like I say, you never know, I never know when I'm going to be rejected. And you were definitely rejected after that White House event. I mean, Yes, what, because when Seymour Hirsch called me, I remember her being, it was on my birthday or something like that, and I was taking my big dog, July, up to the mountains in the snow with my daughter, Kit, and her friends. And the phone rang just as I was going out the door. And he said, this is Seymour Hirsch from the New York Times. We have something that we would like you to give us permission to print. <laughs> it was from the CIA dossier. Me? On a CIA dossier? How could that possibly be? I'm a good American citizen, quote unquote. You know, that kind of feeling. And he said, we have found a list you of you on the this dossier and we have and he was reading it to me that she's one of six children and she ran away from home when she was blah 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 none of that is true and they were interviewing people the CIA that is were interviewing people that I had worked with from time to time in a show or the other one of them which whose name I will not remember will not say but he worked with me in The Owl and the Pussycat. Now you know who it is because there were only two of us. <laughs> His interview was, she's a bitch. She would do anything in the world to get the audience on her side, including pulling her pants down. So then I realized this is, this is words. You know, I was hurt, of course. But that's what they did. They went from people to people whom you have worked with from time to time at various stages of your life. And no matter how many people they talk to, somebody is going to see something negative and derogatory about you. 
Didn't they say something about how you were a nymphomaniac or something? Or sexually... What has know? that got to do with the CIA if I was? Uh, it seems... Ridiculous. Absolutely. But, but it became a situation where, where people that you had worked with for ages were somehow now not available to you and jobs weren't available to you. That's right. How did you feel as you were discovering what was happening? I don't think I really thought about it. I didn't realize that I was being rejected in the United States and I couldn't find work. I thought, well, maybe my popularity is waning. My record sales are not up. Maybe that's because even the hotel ambassador, whom I had a contract with three weeks after that luncheon, couldn't find the contract all of a sudden. And neither could the William Morris Agency all of a sudden. When did it start hitting you? What was really going on? I think that's when it hit me, when Seymour Hirsch called me and told me this is what's happening. But I didn't recognize that, and then you don't expect anything like that to be happening in your own country, my wonderful country. That can't be happening. And I realized, too, that my house was being bugged, and that some, you can always feel when some foreign spirit has entered your space, so to speak. And I felt all that. And I would call up my friend Albert Popwell and I'd say, this phone sounds very funny. Are you playing tricks on me, Poppy? And he'd say, oh, Kit, you're on one of your voodoo trips again. They all, all of my friends said that to me. So we would laugh it off and let it go. But then Seymour Hersh said, and Jack Anderson, who eventually was interviewed about this particular incident with Eartha Kid and Mrs. Johnson, he said, yes, she was targeted. And so what could you do? How could you respond? What did you do? You don't respond. You say absolutely nothing. You laugh it off and go to Europe, <laughs> where I was more name, more popular anyway at that particular time, or at least I was just as popular. And that is when, out of nowhere, comes a helping hand. Because it was shortly thereafter that Jeffrey uh, uh, Holder came to my house in Beverly Hills and asked if I would do Timbuktu. But it was Jeffrey Holder that put me back on Broadway. And that's when that incident happened, and even before, once they saw my face, they started giving me an, a standing ovation. Welcoming you home. Welcoming you home.